we have a triple play, so to speak. I guess it's the, the baseball playoffs. We've got three speakers. Um, Michael Buckley, he's the director of asset management at ReEnergy Holdings, uh, which is a big bio company, biopower company up in northern New York. Um, he's responsible for marketing customer interactions of all ReEnergy's Re northeast operations. Before ReEnergy, he worked at Covanta Energy. He's a business manager looking at regional operations, including waste to energy facilities, landfills, transfer stations, and things like that. And prior to that, he was with EAC operations and um, looking at their northeast op uh, operations. Um, second speaker is Robert McDonough. So, so Mike Buckley is the, the guy who's the end use of the energy crops. And Robert McDonough, our second speaker, is the owner of Celtic Energy Farm, who is the producer of the willow we're going to be talking about today. He, was, he comes from Ireland. He grew up on a tillage and a calf to finish beef herd farm in Ireland. He also did cereal production and potato production on that farm. He attended an ag college in Ireland, and he moved to the US in early 1990. Currently resides in New York City. Uh, so Celtic Energy, his company started operations in 2009 when they, they bought about 500 plus acres in Jefferson County. Bought some more in 2012. I'm sure you'll hear more about it today. And he's been working on planting uh, around 1,000 acres of, or managing 1,000 acres plus of scrub, shrub willow in northern New York, which is the focus of our talk today. And working closely with Tim Vogue, who's our third speaker, and he's with a senior research associate at SUNY ESF. He's had a long 25 plus year experience working in forestry, agroforestry, and these short rotation woody crops, specifically uh, willow. Um, he's also had some international experience. He has many projects looking at these cropping systems. Um, also, willow is, for industrial waste sites is, is a research area of his. And he also looks at the economics and as using willow in agroforestry systems, such as snow fences and things like that. So I'm going to turn it over to um, one of you three. And welcome. And thank you. OK, so uh, my name is Tim Volk, and uh, I'm going to start the, the presentation and discussion today. Uh, and just to give you an outline of where we're going, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on willow biomass crops and some context of where dedicated energy crops like that might fit into the supply and what some of the challenges are facing uh, the expansion of willow biomass crops uh, in the areas where they're being grown and looked at. Uh, Mike Buckley is going to talk to us about the USDA uh, BCAP program and what has occurred there with uh, a Willow project area in northern uh, and central New York, and also tell us a little bit more about ReEnergy and what they're doing to produce renewable power using biomass. Uh, we'll then talk about uh, various activities that have gone on on the acreage that has been enrolled in the BCAP project. and. Since Robert is the person that's out there at the front line uh, putting the crops in the ground and now starting to harvest them, he'll, uh, he'll talk about some of those issues uh, as we get to that point in the presentation. <clears throat> so just this slide is from the, the USDOE billion ton report that came out a couple years ago. And I just put it in here to give us a little bit of context of where perennial energy crops are going to fit in so you can see <clears throat> You can see here that um, the DOE numbers uh, over time from 2012 to 2030, and that's to line up with the renewable fuel standard targets, but several categories. And what you can see here is that energy crops start coming on, uh, in theory, in a few years. And by the time that targets are reached in 2030, they make up a considerable 40% or so of the total amount of biomass that uh, has the potential to be produced here in the United States. So while there's not a lot of dedicated energy crops in the ground now, be they uh, woody energy crops or herbaceous energy crops, the numbers, the acreage is fairly limited. 
The anticipation is that in order to grow the biomass supply into the future, uh, energy crops are going to have to be an important part of the mix and the growth potential going forward. So we're talking about one of those uh, today <clears throat> in terms of willow and where does that fit in. We often think of willow as fitting in uh, with a mixture of other woody biomass resources. So uh, in contrast to thinking about willow being a sole source uh, supply for, uh, particularly for larger scale facilities or operations, uh, we tend to look at it as being a part of a mix. So there's a variety of sources of woody biomass out there, be they from uh, forestry harvesting operations and thinnings or residues from various uh, manufacturing facilities. So lots of different sources and what we see is short rotation woody crops being a part of the mix of that supply uh, going forward. So when we think about short rotation woody crops and try and then put them in context, um, this is what this slide is trying to do for us. So if we think about this scale of all the way from uh, natural forests here on the left, natural forest systems, all the way through to uh, highly intensive managed uh, agricultural systems at the other end, uh, where do uh, short rotation woody crops fit in? So the scales below have to do with indicators of the amount of soil manipulation or management and civicultural inputs, uh, the amount of management of woody systems in particular. Uh, and this will just give us an idea of where different supplies of woody biomass fit in. So natural forests fit out uh, towards the left side, natural managed forests, as opposed to out at the left end, which might be unmanaged natural forests, which we're not necessarily gathering biomass from. And then in the plantation realm, you have things like southern pine that's getting a lot of attention in uh, the further south. Uh, in the southeast U.S., eucalyptus, and certainly in other parts of the world, eucalyptus gets a lot of attention uh, for various uses, including bioenergy. And then we fall into this range of what's called short rotation wheat crops, and this is where things like hybrid poplar would fit in, uh, most traditionally grown on a 8 to 10 year rotation, although people are now looking at growing it on a 2 to 3, three year rotation. And then shrub willow, what we're talking about today, uh, is grown on a much shorter rotation and, and has more management inputs than these other systems. So we're getting close to an agricultural system. It's not quite an agricultural system. Uh, it's also not quite a forestry system. Uh, so sometimes that's one of the challenges. It doesn't really fit in either one of those traditional fields. But on this scale, that's where shrub willow would sort of fit in uh, on the systems. So why shrub willow? Why the focus on willow biomass crops? So there's a lot of characteristics of willow that make it appealing. There's a lot of genetic variability out there and, and just beginning to uh, scratch the surface of that with breeding that has gone on over the years and continues to occur uh, largely at Cornell but also in some other uh, places as well and as well as overseas. Uh, its compassing ability is an important characteristic, so after you cut it down, it sprouts back, and I'll show you how we fit that into the, into the cropping uh, cycle here in a minute. So other characteristics, of course, if you're going to grow energy crops, you need to have high biomass production potential uh, in order to make the system economically viable, and, and willow certainly has that potential. It's relatively easy to get it established uh, using unrooted hardwood cuttings. At this point in time, there are limited insect and pest problems, although any time you start scaling up a crop and expanding it, there's the chance that uh, those things will occur, and so there's ongoing work uh, monitoring for insects and pests across a number of trials. Europe has a fair amount of this in the ground already uh, in terms of shrub willow being grown for energy. Here in the U.S., we're just at the front end of this expansion or scale-up process. This is just a quick snapshot to give you an idea of where trials have been uh, done in the past or are ongoing uh, across uh, the region. So it's not just a local northeast uh, issue. It's been tried and continues to be tried in a number of areas across the U.S. and Canada. This is the basic production system that uh, is being worked with. Uh, so it starts with Site preparation, so focusing uh, primarily on marginal agricultural land, uh, but proper site preparation is essential to getting the system started properly. So controlling weeds and existing vegetation that's on the site and preparing the site for planting. 
We then go through planting, which occurs in the springtime, uh, and then it gets growing. So this uh, picture down on the bottom left is, you know, a few weeks old, uh, but also illustrates the double row system that is typically worked with here. And that double row system is really set up to facilitate harvesting. After the first year, we would typically go in and coppice it. So basically go in and cut this material down back to two to four inches above the ground. And that's really to cause it to sprout and produce a lot more stems and a lot more foliage more rapidly in the following spring. So it sprouts back in the early spring after coppicing with a lot more stems and looks a lot more like a bush. On the right hand side, we have one year old material uh, after it has been coppiced. So it would be on a two year old root system, but one year old above ground. Typically, we'll let it grow to three or four years. So here at the top, uh, we're at a stage where it's typically ready for harvest. And then we come in during the dormant season and harvest material, uh, cut it off uh, <coughs> with a, uh, this harvester here is one that's been worked on with New Holland. It's a forged chopper with a specially designed cutting head. So it comes through and cuts the material and chips it and blows it into wagons or trucks. After that, the following spring, we're back here to this sprouting again. We run for another three years, and then we're anticipating that you can go seven times uh, around this three-year cycle uh, with this type of a system. Okay, so what's, what are some of the things that have happened in the recent past that have helped uh, to move this system forward? There's been work going on uh, in the Northeast on shrub willow for over 25 years now, but in the last few years, a couple of significant things have happened to uh, make it possible to begin thinking about expanding uh, this system beyond research and demonstration trials to larger scale plantings. So one of these is the supply of large, large supply of planting stock. So if you're going to scale up a crop and put it out across the landscape, someone needs to be producing the material. Uh, and up until a number of, a few years ago, there wasn't a large scale supply of that. But there's now a nursery in western New York called Double A Willow. They have about 150 acres of shrub willow nursery beds in the ground of varieties that have been selected specifically uh, over the years uh, by researchers at ESF and Cornell uh, for the right characteristics for this kind of production. And there's annual production potential there of somewhere around 10 million cuttings. So, there is material now available for commercial scale up and the lessons have been learned uh, by the nursery operator and his team uh, out of AA Willow so that if demand grew, they could expand uh, fairly rapidly. Another issue a number of years ago that was a problem was getting a consistent, reliable material delivered to end users uh, in a form that was usable in the systems that they had in place without further uh, work or, or sizing. So over the last few years, uh, there's been work done with uh, New Holland, uh, and they have taken their forage chopper, which is typically used to chop corn or other agricultural crops. And what they've done, and what you can see in this picture, is a specially designed uh, cutting head uh, that is now mounted on the front of that forage chopper. The rest of the machine is basically the same uh, without changes on it. And you can go through now and cut willow and turn it into consistent, nice quality chips that can then be delivered to an end user. So that doesn't solve all the problems by any means, and there's a number of challenges going forward. Uh, some of the main ones have to do with the high establishment costs. So one of the challenges with Willow, and I'll show you some graphs in a minute, uh, is that there's a large investment at the front end, and the payback period takes time. You have this long perennial crop, but the investment is required at the front end to get it in the ground and get it established. Market uncertainty is an issue uh, because if you're going to have a crop that's going to be in the ground for 20 or so years, uh, are you, do you have any sort of certainty or confidence that there'll be a market to sell the material in the future? So if you can grow the crop but can't sell it, that's not going to help in terms of making it profitable. <coughs> There's not a lot of this been grown, so landowners and producers are not familiar with the crop, and there have been very few large scale operations of this, and so people are not particularly familiar with the system and how it would work, and so it creates hesitancy amongst landowners to engage in the process. So just to give you an idea of what the cash flow looks like, this is, these are numbers out of a cash flow model that has been developed. Uh, it's available on the web uh, at, the, at ESF uh, if you want to play with it. 
And it's got all sorts of parameters that you can put in and change. And here are the sort of uh, numbers that are in this base case scenario. It's got a 100-acre land area. It includes everything from site preparation through seven harvests over 22 years, uh, and includes removal of willow at the end. It's got a 25-mile delivery distance. Uh, it's got yields here of five drive tons per acre per year and a price of uh, just over $27 a green ton delivered to the plant gate. So again, you can change all those parameters in this model, but these are the ones that we ran to kind of reflect the situation before the VTAP came into place. <coughs> so here you can see in terms of dollars, U.S. dollars per acre undiscounted, that the upfront investment in the first couple of years doing the site preparation and getting the crop in the ground, uh, some was $900 to $1,000 or more uh, to get the crop uh, in the ground, $900 to $1,000 an acre to get the crop in the ground. And then your first positive cash flow doesn't incur here until year four. So this is one of the challenges. You've got this large upfront investment and this delayed time in terms of when your positive cash flow occurs. If we put that into a cumulative graph over time and just add those bars all up over time, it gives you uh, another, another snapshot or look at this. So here's the initial investment that's required. And actually, the payback time or the break-even point is not out here until uh, three or four uh, harvests down the road. And you can see down below that the internal rate of return is not great. And there's a, that there's a fair amount of risk associated with the system at this point in time. Uh, and so not that many people wanting to invest uh, with that kind of risk number involved. So that's another issue in terms of uh, trying to expand and grow the crop um, in terms of these upfront investments and the payback period required uh, before you make your money back. Okay, so Mike Buckley is going to talk now about uh, about the USDA BCAP program and ReEnergy's role in, in that and what else they're doing producing energy. Thank you, Tim, and good afternoon. Um, back in March of 2012, ReEnergy was approached by uh, numerous stakeholders, including representatives of Jefferson and Lewis counties, uh, SUNY ESF, and Cato Analytics um, inquiring as to our interest in participating in a BCAP submittal uh, to further the development of shrub willow. At that time, uh, ReEnergy had just uh, completed its acquisition of an uh, existing coal fire plant and was proceeding to convert that facility to a biomass facility, um, the Black River facility located in Fort Drum, New York. So I think I believe the stakeholders anticipated our presence in northern New York growing as we already had uh, two other biomass facilities at the current time. And for a complete submittal to BCAP, you really need a, um, an end user that can step up and make this project economical. And here's the timeline. Um, the implementa implementation of the program uh, was extremely time sensitive. Um, we were, after we uh, initiated our discussions in March, we submitted a proposal in the spring of 2012. We were informed in May that we were accepted, and but we had to hold off until mid-June until the USDA made the announcement. Um, once the announcement was made with the help of SUNY ESF and Ginny Green over at USDA and FSA office in Syracuse, uh, we expedited meetings, uh, six informational meetings in the communities to do an outreach program, to explain the economics, and to try to attract um, farmland from individual owners. All this had to be accomplished in basically what ended up being a three-month time period as the contracts had to be signed by mid-September. The original award for our BCAP program was encompassed 3,500 acres and a total grant of just over $4 million. 
One of the, I believe what the major issues was, uh, as Tim alluded to, was the length of commitment from farm owners. They had to step up to 11 year, 11 year contracts with us. Uh, and again, had to be comfortable within only a three month period. Um, having said that, I believe the USDA uh, and the FSA was very happy with the program and regarded our program as, as, as a success in that we managed to sign up just under 1,200 acres and were able to secure $1.2 million of the initial grant. Uh, this slide shows the BCAP fields of the acreage that was signed up for our BCAP program. And I want to mention here that there is some intent here. Although we had three facilities at the time in New York, uh, the one plant was idled at the time given its individual economics. So we really tried to focus um, the BCAP uh, acreage around Black River and some existing down in line, near the Linesdale facility that we, we own. With the end knowing that Black River could end up taking the majority of the materials uh, because we had a, um, been awarded a 10-year uh, renewable energy contract with the state of New York. So we, could, we were confident we could step up to the time frame required, as Tim pointed out, on the cash flows in order to make these landowners get the economic benefit of their commitment. A little bit about the BCAP program, as Tim pointed out, nearly $1,000 an acre to establish a willow, shrub willow crop, and the BCAP really comes into play here as it reimburses 75% of the total eligible costs, which comes out just, just under $750 an acre. Um, additional payments under the BCAP program include a rental payment for the landowner, which is based on the soil type, and we were afforded the opportunity to, under the BCAP program, to shift some funds and provide additional incentive to the landowners. And we really, um, we did that to its max, which was 25%, uh, because we really wanted to make, um, try to appeal to the landowner and make that rental payment um, as uh, appealing as possible. As Tim pointed out, the model uses uh, $35 per acre and there is no rental payments in the harvest years because you will get the income from um, the harvest when it's delivered to our facility. Again, as Tim touched upon on his without BCAP slides in the economics of the willow, here it is with the BCAP taken into account. And of course, it's, it's all about the upfront uh, initial investment costs and then being able to carry out the cash flows of the harvest and results in, uh, takes a return uh, in 13 years of a negative 1% to a IRR, uh, given the assumptions here, of approximately 30%. So uh, taking away the, the uh, down the initial investment of the landowner really gives um, really gives uh, appeal to the process and the project and makes it worth uh, investing in. Um, of course, one of the benefits is some job creation. Uh, there are some assessments that, as the slide reads, uh, states that for every thousand acres of willow planted and harvested, there could be anywhere from four to eight jobs created. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Bogas, who will provide you a little detail about uh, re-energy holdings and our efforts in the Northeast. So re-energy holdings has quickly become one of the largest biomass to energy companies in the United States. Uh, we are a portfolio company of Riverstone Holdings, LLC. We own and operate facilities that use forest-derived woody biomass and other wood waste residues to produce renewable energy. We also own facilities that recycle construction and demolition debris. We were formed in 2008 by affiliates of Riverstone Holdings and a senior management co-investor team that was comprised of experienced industry professionals. We operate in six states, employ about 315 people, 
And we own and or operate nine energy production facilities with a combined capacity to generate 325 megawatts of energy. Our nine energy facilities are in four states, New York, Maine, Connecticut, and North Carolina. Our resource recovery facilities are located in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Maine. And this map just visually depicts our portfolio, which is you know, primarily in the Northeast. Um, this slide discusses our footprint in New York State. We are headquartered in New York State in the Albany area. We have about 80 employees and 103 megawatts of installed capacity. The rule of thumb in the biopower sector is that one megawatt of power creates between three and seven jobs, one at the facility and the rest as spin-off jobs, most of them harvesting fuel. And all of our facilities in New York are in the north country of New York. And just quickly, I'll run through our facilities in New York. The, the Black River facility, uh, 60 megawatts. Lionsdale in Lewis County is 22 megawatts. The Shattagay facility, that is the facility that is currently idled, is a 21 megawatt facility. A uh, little more detail on the facilities. Um, the Black River facility is inside the fence at the Fort Drum U.S. Army installation in Jefferson County, New York. It's a facility that formerly utilized coal as its primary fuel, and we invested over $30 million to retrofit the facility to utilize biomass as its primary fuel. It commenced operations as a biomass facility in late May. And this is a facility that we anticipate will take the vast majority of the shrub willow fuel. Uh, the Lionsdale facility also will be taking some of the shrub willow and is located um, when Mike showed you the map earlier on the lower right in the Oneida County, Lewis County area, um, it will be taking the fuel from that area. Um, and it employs about 22 individuals. And uh, Mike is going to tell you a little bit about a test that was done of shrub willow back in 2011 that really increased our comfort level in signing up for this project. And just a little bit more on Shattagay. This is the facility that's currently idled, but we are aggressively pursuing op, um, opportunities to resume operations at that facility. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah alluded to, we, we in 2011, we did do a test with the willow burn, um, with the shrub willow fuel. And um, that was probably a key component to us signing up um, for the BCAP program and being comfortable with that and moving forward. Um, with the fuel trial, we look to ascertain the different data points uh, involving you know, anything from uh, the storage to the um, harvest season to fuel blending, uh, the way we had, uh, could feed it into the plant, and of course, how it would combust given our existing technologies. That fuel trial uh, was took place over four days, and we ran different um, start and stop trial periods during those four days, in which we combusted anywhere from 10% uh, uh, shrub willow on a weight uh, on a weight basis to up to 45% um, shrub willow uh, as a blend with harvest wood chip. Um, the results of the trial were that. Um, obviously, the willow we found to be a suitable fuel. Um, we had no issues with the blending. Uh, we were able to meet um, all the mission standards during those trial periods. So it was all in all a successful trial. Some of the benefits uh, when Ren Energy was Ren Energy was approached for the BCAP program was, of course, the fuel diversification. Um, it, it's certainly helpful to have um, uh, different opportunities as uh, markets come and go for a lot of our materials. And uh, you know, fuel supply is, it can be very cyclical at times. And we were, um, were anxious to try to help develop um, different renewable fuels. Um, we, we also realized that this was just, uh, our role here was just to try to further what uh, the folks at SUNY ESF and Cornell have already put forth, and that you know, 
to have a, to establish and sustain a a truly viable renew, renewable energy fuel, you really need more markets than just uh, ourselves. And we realize that we realize to have success that um, you need different outlets. People need to know that uh, when they uh, produce the material, that it's going to have a home. And hopefully, from this uh, VCAP program, uh, there can be additional outlets uh, developed um, through the uh, time and efforts of all the uh, participants involved. Uh, there, of course, we touched on the job creation before, and um, the use of marginal farmland was also important, especially with uh, Reenergy having a smaller presence back in 2011, but to again further that presence in the North Country in Central New York in 2012, especially with the Black River Generation facility coming online uh, later in that year, we, were, we lo looked at it to really be a, a, a partner in the community and to try to provide opportunity to the local economy as well. Um, the production agreements, um, as I say, were 11-year agreements, 11-year contracts, uh, included three harvest cycles. and. The threshold that we threw out there for the home landowners uh, was basically um, approximately 100 acres to participate. Um, I think one of the reasons we did that was we wanted to make sure um, we could effectively manage the program, and most of that management goes through um, SUNY, uh, Tim, Tim's crew at SUNY ESF, as they provide uh, monitoring, feedback, and support to any of the participants in the program. And to you know, try to make a threshold around 100 acres, we thought that was um, effective use of the available resources. Um, in the production agreement, we stepped up to uh, to pay $27.50 per green ton for the willow delivered to our facilities. Um, we also stepped uh, the BCAP program program provides a rental payment of $30 per acre. And it states here that um, Reenergy makes sure that the rental payment is made uh, prior to we, us paying for any deliveries. Uh, we haven't had any issues, obviously, within the program, but one of the concerns we, we had was to make sure that the, any landowner that participated uh, was receiving the payments, and we just wanted uh, some protection on that end. And now I'll turn it back to Tim Volk, who can talk about the uh, spring planting season. Okay, thanks, Mike, for a great overview of uh, both Green Energy and the BCAP program. So, <clears throat> as Mike had mentioned, that the area in the BCAP program is made up of two components. There was uh, new acreage that was uh, planted this spring, and then there was existing acreage uh, that had been planted previously, but USDA allowed to be rolled into the program. So, uh, Robert, Robert McDonough is going to step in here and make a few comments about uh, the spring planting effort and, and what was accomplished uh, over the course of this spring on, on the land that they're managing. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, Celtic Energy started operations in 2009. Um, bought some land up in Jefferson County. Um, late 2009, we made an agreement with a, a predecessor of uh, Reenergy called uh, Catalyst Renewables, um, and we agreed to plant 60 uh, co-plant 60 acres with them on our farm in uh, Cape Prince in New York um, as a trial run to see how willow would, would grow in the North Country. Um, so we did that. Um, we shared the cost with Catalyst on that. Um, and then last year, obviously, we got in touch with Reenergy. And uh, with, with the help of Tim Folk, um, Dan Connable, and especially the people of Reenergy, Mike Buckley and these guys, uh, we, would, we would have no bee caps. So that's, that's where we are with the bee cap. Um, there's no way we would have planted extra acreage without the assistance of BCAP, and I don't think there would be a Willow project in the North Country without it. Um, so once we got the BCAP in place, we, just look, we went to look for some acreage. Um, we had 450 tillable acres on our own farm in Cape Vincent, and we ended up buying another 200 acres in... Um, 
Pillar Point, which is just south of Cape Vincent. And uh, we also ended up taking over existing acres down in Oneida and Lewis counties uh, from Catalyst Renewables, which were existing crops that they had planted around the Lions Airfield City. So now we have just under 1,100 acres under the Celtic Energy uh, umbrella. Uh, there is one other farmer, um, Marty Mason, up in Cape Vincent, who planted 110 acres. So basically, this, that's the two operations that's going on in the Willow. Uh, this spring, we planted just uh, under 800 acres of Willow, um, mixing up to seven, eight varieties of different Willow that we uh, had bought from uh, AA Willow uh, over in Fredonia, New York. Um, Conditions were very, very wet this spring, as, as it's probably all recall, uh, one of the wettest springs uh, that we have had in a number of years, um, which kind of uh, was a disadvantage, but a huge advantage at the same time. Because uh, last year, you recall, that was one, one of the driest summers on record, um, which came that uh, when we got the, the willow cuttings or when the willow cuttings were harvested. Um, it left that there were a very thin um, cutting, so it made it difficult to plant one, and two, it didn't leave a, lo a lot of food within the plant to grow. Uh, so that's where the rain came in, and all the uh, most of our early plantings are doing very, very well. Some of the later plantings, not so well because it started to dry up, and the thinner cuttings dried up much faster than we anticipated. So uh, all in all, out of the 700 acres we planted, we may have to replant about 40 acres. Um, uh, so that was the planting season. Uh, we, we ended up starting planting mid-May mid because of the weather. Uh, our last planting was in the first week of July. So that's, uh, that was a window that we had um, stop and start because of the weather. Uh, but once we were going, our machinery worked very well. We, have a, we had the set planter that uh, Tim gave us from uh, ESF, the, which is in that photograph there, the blue planter. And we also called in two planters from uh, AA Willow from Dennis Rake over in Fredonia. And he is two of the Egendahl planters, which you see on the on the right of that picture in front of you. Um, so that was the planting season. We did uh, obviously a lot of uh, land prep beforehand. And since that, we've, uh, uh, we did a pre-emergence spray after planting. And we've sprayed twice since with a uh, with, a, with a, a herbicide to try and kill some of the broadleaf weeds, to try and keep the weeds weeds down. Um, Tim alluded to a few minutes ago that we're uh, currently harvesting some of the existing crops down in Oneida County. Uh, we have about 45, 50 acres already harvested. Um, we intend to harvest about 150 this uh, fall, this winter. Um, we bought a New Holland FR 1990 harvester forage harvester. Uh, you've seen one of the earlier pictures was the yellow machine. And we just purchased a, a willow cutting head or a biomass cutting head from New Holland, um, which we believe is the first New Holland biomass cutting head sold in the USA. Uh, there's a number of them sold in Europe, but we're, this is the first to be sold in the USA. So we're using that at the moment. Um, conditions are pretty good at the moment because the weather has been pretty good. Uh, so. We hope to have most of the harvest done within the next three to four weeks. Um, so that's basically our operation, and I'll, I'll pass it back to Tim. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, uh, Robert. Sorry for uh, for giving us uh, an idea of where Celtic uh, Energy Farms fits in, and and the work that you guys are doing to make it all happen. One of the things that ESF is doing is in assistance, in a, in addition to providing some technical assistance, is doing some monitoring to try and get a handle on. Uh, different operations that are going on. So here's just an example of some of the data we collected this spring with uh, GPS units. So uh, two, the two different planters that Robert talked about, the step planter and the Egadal planter, uh, and giving you an idea of what the total acreage, this is not the total acreage that they necessarily planted, this is the total acreage where we actually had GPS units and did monitoring. So the planting rates, uh, when you look at a mean planting rate is a little bit different, but maybe a better way to look at this data because of the way it's distributed is median planting rates, and so not a big difference in these median planting rates. So once they get out and going in the field, uh, we're getting 
uh, you know, several acres an hour being planted. And then there's some other data here on uh, non-productive time in terms of stops and what the average downtime or stop time, delay time was, and again, between the planters, for the average delay time or the median delay time, not dramatically different uh, between these two different systems. So that information will be useful both in economic analysis and life cycle analysis uh, and, in, and in further discussions going forward to try and improve the efficiency of these types of operations. So just a couple of things in terms of uh, ongoing uh, activities. Uh, I do want to mention that on October the 17th, Robert has mentioned that they are harvesting uh, existing uh, willow crops now. Uh, on October the 17th, there is a uh, national bioenergy tour occurring in northern New York. And two of the stops are going to be things that we'll talk about today. So there will be a stop at the Lionsdale plant that We Energy has uh, to look at uh, how wood is being used to generate electricity. And then just after that, there was a stop at a willow field uh, where uh, Robert and his team will demonstrate uh, the harvester. So if you're interested in those things, there's an announcement on the new bio webpage as well as other places. But the new bio webpage has an announcement uh, with details on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Robert talked about the harvesting that's currently going on, so we won't talk about that anymore. But again, just to say that these were crops that were previously established. established. So one of the things in this BCAP project that's different from the others is we have both new crops, but also material that's now being harvested and, and going right in uh, to facilities and being used to produce renewable energy. OK, Robert mentioned that they're going to try and target this 145, 150 acres of willow. There will be some coppicing that needs to occur on the fields that were planted this spring. And Robert also mentioned that uh, some areas that didn't take, there'll be some replanting next spring uh, in order to try and fill in or fill out those areas uh, where it didn't take this current uh, spring. OK, so I think we'll stop there. Uh, and we're happy to take questions. I see. Yeah, I see one question here on the side that I can answer. You want me to do that, Mike? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So there's a question here about what happens in the seventh rotation that makes it a lower yield. So I think, I, I think Tim, you're probably referring to the economics graph and why the the cash flow is lower in the last year. And part of that's got to do because in the last year is where we account for some of the costs associated with willow removal as well. So those get rolled in. It's not that there's necessarily a change in yield. Uh, it's that there's other additional costs. So the net uh, net profit or the net revenue is, is a little lower in that seventh rotation. All right. So folks, I see a couple of you typing there. Please type your questions in. It was a great presentation to give us an overview of you know one of the first at scale energy crop productions in the Northeast. In fact, the only one. And I'll just add, I mentioned new bio at the beginning. Um, we are trying to focus on creating these, quote, demonstration areas where we are showing that you can produce these crops at scale and provide you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of tons a year to a facility. And, and northern New York is one of them. I'll add that um, the northwest Pennsylvania and northeast Ohio region is another area where we have miscanthus and switchgrass growing, um, at about 10,000 acres of it. And then in West Virginia, we're working with some companies such as Midwest Vaco to develop large plantations on some of their abandoned mine lands. So uh, I see Ben has a question here. Um, Tim, you mentioned that. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, so the co that's what the purpose of the coppicing is, is really to generate more stems on each plant. So typically, after planting these unrooted cuttings, you might get two or three stems on a plant. And after you coppice it the following spring, you may have anywhere from 8 to 15 stems on a plant. So it makes them bushier, gives you more leaf area, and, and uh, increases growth. So Greg, Greg asked a question here about why stop at seven rotations if yields don't decrease. So the limiting factor is not so much the plant biology. There's a couple of things. One is the spacing, uh, and I didn't get into a lot of detail, but this double row spacing that we use, 
uh, allows access with the harvester. Every time you harvest these plants, what's going to happen is as they re-sprout, they're going to tend to have more sprouts on the outside. So the width of the base of the plant is going to increase. And at some point, it's going to increase to the point where you're not going to be able to get a harvester in there without either damaging the plants or damaging the harvester. So biologically, you could keep going. But in terms of the crop management, it's also it's probably not likely. The other thing is that. You, know, you may not even want to go to seven rotations. If there's new genetic material that's out there that's giving you know significantly larger yields, it may make sense from an economic point of view to take material out sooner than the seventh rotation and replace it with better material. Go ahead. So I think Gary's. What prompts the seven? Oh, you mentioned that. Um, right. So that's that's sort of the same discussion. It's it's really this space limitation for crop management as much as anything. Okay. Zane asked about a power plant question. Uh, the moisture, um, the green chips. I guess you're taking green chips already. They might from from wood products. So how does it differ? I think I think some of the during some of the trial the. The willow had a little bit higher moisture, um, but certainly the one way we deal with that at Lionsdale is just through the blending of the material. Um, at Black River Generation, uh, we have, you know, we fire alternative fuels as well. So if, if there was um, a higher moisture issue, uh, we'd probably lean on some of the alternative fuels, um, such as. Um, um, you know, TDF, uh, tire-derived uh, two-inch minus chip, or uh, we take other things such as uh, high BTU fuels, such as clean wood pallets, um, and sometimes we take uh, creosote uh, fuels as well. So um, certainly uh, blending uh, is, is the answer, but um, as the trial uh, indicated, um, at varying levels of fuel blending, anywhere from 10 to 45% by weight of willow with harvest tree chips, uh, we we were fine with the emissions and and so the blending was successful in that regard. Okay, I just want to add to that. Um, so, what percent of your intake, your feedstock, is coming or will come from willow when those acreage is off at full production mm -hmm. harvest? It would probably be anywhere from five to seven percent during the harvest years. Okay. Um, I see Paul has a question about using poultry for uh, willow for poultry bedding, and then and then burning that. I guess um, the question on small acreage uh, that that's a big question because we in New Bio are not even encouraging production because of the harvesting logistics issues on smaller acreages. Um, but I'll let Tim add to that. So I, mean, I think to address specifically the question of is there harvesting equipment and planting equipment available, one of the things that the new bio project has done is to uh, help support the costs of some pieces of these equipment. So there is uh, planting equipment that will be available uh, not for free, but at a reduced cost uh, through the new bio program. Um, and also, uh, details are still being worked out, but it looks like there'll also be a, uh, a forage harvester type system that would be uh, available. Uh, that's the one that Robert has, so he can jump in and comment on that. But New Bio is also looking at a smaller, um, a smaller tractor-mounted harvester system as well that might be appropriate for some of the smaller areas uh, that you're interested in, Paul. I'll just add to that. I mean, what I meant to say is that we, you know, we, we not encourage, we, you know, smaller acreages can be harvested with some of that, that, those smaller harvesters, but we want to make sure they have a market. Um, that's the critical thing. You know, people just planting the willow and then finding three years down the line they can't sell it. So that's why we trying to consolidate in these demo areas where we know they are markets. All right, Ben uh, asks, what kind of lands are best suited for willow, specifically kinds of marginal land? Are we working on that in new bio uh, before the, the um, 
obviously that's a, what is marginal, you know, it, it's biophysical and economic, but obviously we want to do it on lands that aren't typically used for food crops. Anyone else want to jump in there? Yes, I think in the Northeast, one of the conditions that makes often makes land marginal is, is drainage conditions and poor drainage. And so willow does well in those kind of conditions. Uh, you know, it does well on good ag land, uh, but that's, as Mike said, what we are not necessarily trying to target that. And there's other higher value, more important uh, crops that are being used for that kind of acreage. So willow has a very broad uh, range of, of, of soil conditions that it'll operate uh, in. and I think a fair amount of the marginal land that, that ends up being looked at or being uh, proposed for projects like this tends to be areas that are more poorly drained uh, because that's an often limiting condition in the Northeast US. OK, Gary asks about the boundary between small and large, large plantations. And again, that's a, a relative question. Um, Obviously, the market is critical on the price you can get on those small plantations. And then the harvesting machinery, um, they all come into play in that decision. Um, but I don't think there's a clear acreage d distinction. Tim? Yeah, I think a lot of that's got to do with, again, uh, if you've got uh, a market that's set up and, and is ready to take the material at a given price and you can make the economics work, then, then the size of the land area needed uh, can vary uh, quite a bit. But one of the challenges is that you've got these fixed costs of bringing in a piece of equipment, either a planter or more frequently every three years bringing in a harvester. And so you know, that, f that cost is fixed to bring that piece of equipment in. Uh, and so if you're spreading that over, you know, 10 acres uh, versus uh, 150 acres, then the cost per acre is going to be much higher on the smaller land areas. That's, that's what's one of the main challenges, I think. Um, I've got a qu another question um, as other people are typing. Uh, you know, I know the time issue was a big issue with getting farmers to sign up for BCAP, but were there other key constraints? Because the incentive looked like a no-brainer um, in terms of their uh, op opportunities to, to make use of the land. So I'll jump in and comment on that. I mean, yeah, the numbers look great. Uh, the reality is the way people make these decisions uh, takes time. And so we were basically approaching them in mid-July and encouraging them to have applications done by the end of August. So they had to understand uh, a new crop that they had very little exposure or uh, experience with. They were had to understand a USDA uh, program. And, and those aren't always necessarily easy to understand. Uh, and they were being asked to sign up for an 11-year commitment uh, you know, with penalties if they pulled out of the program uh, before that period of time. So those were all things that I think created some barriers. I think there were quite a few people that were interested but not, didn't have enough time to ask enough questions and see enough of examples of the crop that was out there to make a decision about whether to pull the trigger uh, for that kind of a commitment or not. Okay, Paul asks again about the revenue expected for fuel and what are your fixed costs. Uh, we're working on some fact sheets on enterprise budgets, Paul, but um, um, and that's, that's a big question. Obviously, there's a lot of fixed costs and variable costs. Anyone else want to add to that answer? So you can, Paul, if you want, that, um, you know, Mike's working on those fact sheets that will explain it. If you really wanted to dig into it, the Willow model, it can be downloaded and you can look at the sort of cost inputs and then the revenue flows that are generated. And you can, you know, those things change depending upon yield, uh, price, um, you know, the hauling distance that you have to deal with is all built into that and that's a, a factor uh, as well. So there's a whole, uh, you know, slew of both crop management and harvesting and transportation uh, components associated with that. OK, and Gary asks a question about scale again. I think, Gary, we can talk offline on, um, you know, it all depends, again, on your situation. I know you're interested in the St. Vincent planting down in southwest Pennsylvania, which looks like the potential for another large uh, willow plantation area. but. Um, 
I think that's something we can talk about separately. Um, I see we're coming to the end of our time. Paul asked about BCAP. Uh, that's the Biomass Crop Assistance Program that was targeted to growers of bioenergy, giving them a, um, you know, working with an end user like re-energy, biopower. So the idea was to give them an incentive. Unfortunately, it was part of the Farm Bill, and who knows where that's going now. So I don't think there's much um, hope in the, in the short term to see that incentive come back, which is, is a pity, because you heard how dependent Celtic Farm was on, on making that happen. Um, I see Larry's typing a question. We'll just wait for that. If there's, there's no other questions, um, we'll give it another minute. I'll also just add for those on the line still um, that we are going to be beefing up some of our outreach and marketing up there to see what we can do to to get more acreage in production to feed to feed re-energy. So Larry asks, you need 2,000 acres to run the New Holland harvester full time through the season. The tractor mounted harvester can run through 200 to 250 acres in a season. So Paul, I, ho I hope that helps you with a scale issue. Obviously, you can have multiple small owners to add up to that 250 acres, but then, then you get into transportation issues between the ownerships. Um, Paul finally asks about eco model. Um, that Paul talked to Tim Volk. I can share his email with you um, where you can get that model. Yeah, All right, well, uh, so Paul, you can get it at uh, esf.edu backslash willow, and there's a link at the bottom of the page to the economic model. I think it's on one of the slides that I put up as well, that link. All right, well, we've come to the end of our time, and I again want to thank uh, Mike, Robert, Tim, and Sarah uh, for the excellent update on what's happening in the north, uh, northern New York area. And thanks, everyone, for participating. And we'll catch you again in December for the next uh, webinar on pellet production in the global environment. So thanks again. Everyone have a good day, and talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike.